Parenteral access for fluid administration in patients with Ebola virus disease. West Africa is facing the largest ever Ebola epidemic. The number of patients requiring medical care is unprecedented. It's often said that there are no proven treatments for Ebola, but this is simply not true. Case reports from West Africa show that death is often caused by dehydration and electrolyte abnormalities secondary to severe diarrhea. Dehydration and low potassium levels are common treatable causes of death. Fluid administration is a proven treatment for dehydration and potassium supplementation is a proven treatment for low potassium. Whilst these problems are being managed in patients in high income countries, they are not being managed the same way in West Africa. Many patients in West Africa are not receiving these treatments. Because dehydration and electrolyte abnormalities are important but avoidable causes of death in Ebola patients, knowing about effective ways of giving parenteral fluids is critical. This short film shows some ways that fluids can be given to Ebola patients when they're too sick to drink enough. It accompanies a Cochrane systematic review of trials comparing the effectiveness of different ways of getting fluids into sick dehydrated patients. 1. Intravenous Intravenous infusions are the usual way we give fluids to patients who are not drinking enough and the advantage is that most doctors are familiar with this technique. However, putting in an IV cannula can be technically difficult in dehydrated patients, especially for healthcare workers wearing personal protective equipment. In these situations, getting intravenous access can take time. In many Ebola treatment centers, each doctor is responsible for a large number of patients. Patient contact is also limited because of the heat stress from wearing personal protective equipment in a hot climate. Intravenous cannulas can get pulled out, especially in patients who are confused and agitated. This can cause bleeding, especially in Ebola patients who may have low platelet counts. The blood loss might increase the infection risk to healthcare workers. Therefore, it's important to secure and cite the cannula carefully. 2. Intraosseous The intraosseous route is another way of giving fluids and drugs. Intraosseous access uses the highly vascularized bone marrow to deliver fluids and medications. It's an efficient route for getting rapid parenteral access, especially when intravenous access is difficult. For example, in severely dehydrated patients or in young children. It's commonly used in emergency departments that care for injured patients. Our systematic review found that intraosseous lines are easier and quicker to insert than intravenous lines. IO needles can be rapidly inserted by using insertion devices such as the big bone injection gun or the easy IO system. The big system is a spring-loaded bone injection device. It's a single-use, sterile device that's available in adult and pediatric versions. It can be used on conscious and unconscious patients. It's quick and easy to use, requires minimal training and has a long shelf life. It's most often used in the proximal tibia, but in adults it can also be inserted into the proximal humerus. Tibial insertion is into the tibial plateau. The recommended site is a 0.2 cm medial to the tibial tuberosity and 1 cm towards the patella. In conscious patients, a local anaesthetic can be given to reduce pain during insertion. Because the needle is inserted into bone, it might be less likely to be pulled out than an intravenous line. Nevertheless, it's important to properly secure intraosseous access. The Easy IO insertion system entails a battery operated motor that drives a drill tip needle into the bone. It's also quick and easy to use and requires minimal training. It can be used in the humeral head or the proximal tibia. The infusion of intraosseous fluids can be painful, but this can be reduced by using a local anaesthetic. Unlike intravenous access, fluid will not run on its own, and so you have to use a pressure bag to make sure that it runs. The volume of fluid that can be given by the intraosseous route is less than can be given intravenously. The line can be maintained for 24 to 48 hours. 
There is a theoretical risk of osteomyelitis, but this has to be balanced against the risk of death due to dehydration. 3. Subcutaneous Some patients might not be severely dehydrated, but could become dehydrated because they're not drinking enough to keep up with fluid losses. In these patients, the subcutaneous route is a quick and easy way to provide fluids. Subcutaneous infusions are often used to keep patients hydrated in community care settings. However, they might also have a role in the management of patients with Ebola. It should be possible to give around a litre of fluid per 12 hours via the subcutaneous route. Suitable sites are the abdomen, the side of the upper arm, the thighs, the chest and the scapula. The film shows a butterfly needle being inserted into the subcutaneous tissue of the abdomen. In this case, there may be some concern about having a sharp needle that might fall out and cause a needle stick injury to a healthcare worker. However, you can also use an intravenous cannula that does not involve leaving a needle in the patient. Subcutaneous lines can be pulled out, but this does not usually result in much bleeding. But there may be swelling from the accumulation of fluid at the site. 4. Intraperitoneal the intraperitoneal route has been used to give fluids in young children and babies with severe dehydration. Although we couldn't find any clinical trials of this method, it's often been used in resource poor settings to resuscitate children with severe diarrhea because of cholera infection. There aren't many recent descriptions, but an excellent 1953 report in the East African Medical Journal suggests the following procedure. The insertion site is about an inch above the navel. The infusion is warmed to body temperature and run through a giving set. The skin is cleaned and with a thumb in the navel, the abdominal wall can be pinched between the thumb and the forefinger and then lifted up. With the flow completely switched off, the needle is inserted in a controlled way into the subcutaneous tissue. Once the needle is in the subcutaneous tissue, the flow is turned on and the needle is pushed forward. When the needle penetrates the peritoneum, the fluid starts to run. Now it's hoped that the fluid will push away any bowel and reduce the risk of perforation. The needle is then removed and the child is free to move around while the fluid inside is gradually absorbed into the circulation. This short film just summarizes the ways that you can get parenteral access to give fluids and medications in patients with Ebola virus disease. What we do know is that patients in West Africa are dying from dehydration and electrolyte abnormalities and these are treatable.